Suck, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, on my channel, I may have let it slip a few times that I am a vegan. Yes, it's true, I have been a vegan since the year 2003, and I'll be the first to tell you that it hasn't been an easy journey. I know a lot of vegans and their desperation to convince as many people to go vegan as possible will try to portray veganism as some extremely easy lifestyle, but the fact is, is that going vegan is not easy. It forces you to give up a lot of conveniences, such as being able to eat out at most restaurants, and it can potentially create strife with your friends and family members as well, since veganism is a culturally divisive issue that triggers a lot of snowflakes. To give you an example of that, recently the restaurant chain Cracker Barrel introduced the impossible sausage to their menu, which is a vegan sausage made entirely out of plants. Now, they didn't replace their traditional meat-based sausage, rather they just added the Impossible Sausage as a new option. Yet this for some reason caused a bunch of triggered neckbeards to whine about things like woke culture, SJWs, and other irrelevant shit from the lexicon of basement-dwelling incels who don't have a life outside of social media. It's clear that these anti-vegans are extremely insecure since they even have to make food a culture war issue as if what other people eat has any impact on their personal life. Cracker Barrel didn't write or say anything nasty about meat eaters, nor did they remove meat from their menu. They simply just added a plant-based option, and that caused people to absolutely lose their shit, which proves how insecure so many anti-vegans are, which is especially stupid because not everybody who eats these items is necessarily a vegan. Believe it or not, there are some people who maybe just once in a while prefer to have a meal without meat in it. It's not like people occasionally eating a meatless meal every now and then will suddenly turn the frogs gay and then make AOC president. All this drama really proves is that some meat eaters need a safe space from vegans and that makes them the snowflakes more than anything else. People like to cry about how vegans are so pushy all the time, but frankly, for every vegan I see who is pushy about their beliefs, I see about 10 times as many people who have to brag about how much meat they eat every time someone mentions they ate tofu or something. So you hear a lot of these people say that they don't have anything against vegans, they just don't like the pushy vegans, but stories like this really prove that it's just the mere existence of vegans that pisses people off since they can't tolerate the idea of people following a lifestyle that minimizes animal cruelty. I mean, how dare they, right? So, being a vegan, I can understand wanting to promote the vegan lifestyle. However, some people in the vegan community are so damn militant and absolutist about their belief that they think it's acceptable to promote veganism even if it means promoting bullshit while doing so. As a result of this, we sadly see a lot of misinformation being pushed by vegans and sometimes this misinformation is echoed even by medical doctors who happen to be vegan. That brings us to the subject of today's video. Dr. Michael Greger, who is a vegan general practitioner who runs the website and YouTube channel called Nutrition Facts, where he promotes veganism through a health-based perspective. Now, Nothing wrong with any of that, of course. I, as well as most medical and nutrition professionals, probably do agree that a vegan diet can be healthy, provided it is properly planned and includes supplementation like B12. So overall, I probably agree with the vast majority of Dr. Greger's videos, and it's also cool that it looks like he doesn't monetize his videos with ads, even though he has close to a million subscribers. But Recently, Dr. Greger took the interesting step of addressing hair loss in a series of three videos where he posits the idea that there is a plant-based solution for hair loss and that this solution is safer and at least comparable in efficacy to the traditional FDA drug model like finasteride and minoxidil. Well, first of all, I hate taking cheap shots as I think they're often abused as a way to distract from someone's argument and make things personal, but I've got to address the elephant in the room here. Who is in the hell would take hair loss advice from a guy who looks like this? If you had a dentist appointment and the dentist had crooked yellow teeth, would that inspire a lot of confidence if you were getting a root canal? So. Dr. Greger himself is pretty good evidence that veganism by itself is not going to prevent or cure hair loss. But let's take a look at Dr. Greger's claims that taking a plant-based and natural approach to hair loss is more effective and safer than the FDA-approved treatments like finasteride minoxidil. Well, the first of his three videos is regarding supplements, and there isn't anything too egregious about what he says here. He brings up the twin studies to demonstrate the alleged importance in lifestyle compared to just genetics and causing hair loss. Based on twin studies, the heritability of baldness in men is 79%, meaning about 80% of the difference in hair loss between men is genetically determined. But that still leaves some wiggle room. 
He quotes from some twin studies that estimate the heritability of androgenic alopecia is at around 80%. What heritability means is what percentage of hair loss in androgenic alopecia is due to just genetics. This leaves possibly 20% of hair loss as being due to environmental factors. This seems significant, and I already can see people like Rob England jumping on this as proof of the blood flow theory. However, it is very likely that this is an overestimate of these environmental factors because much of this data is based on cell self-assessment or photographs, which can be very subjective and influenced by factors like lighting conditions, camera angles, and hairstyling. Also, when we are talking about differences in hair loss between twins, we are always talking about just relatively minor differences in their hair loss. For example, you can have one twin who is maybe a Norwood 3 and the other twin who is a Norwood 4, but you can never see identical twins where one is a Norwood 1 with a full head of hair and the other is a Norwood 7. Clearly, there are no environmental factors that can do that. In a review article on the genetics of androgenic alopecia that I've quoted several times in my last few videos, the authors feel that the hair heritability of androgenic alopecia is actually higher than 80%. They say, quote, However, the true heritability may even be higher as any random misclassification of androgenic alopecia severity. For example, in studies involving self-assessment would lead to an underestimation of the heritability. The issue of whether environmental factors, in some instances mediated through epigenetic mechanisms, are involved in androgenic alopecia remains unclear." Unquote. There is another exp explanation besides environmental factors that can cause monozygous, also known as identical twins, to have differences in appearance, hair growth, and susceptibility to diseases. This article here notes that despite identical twins having identical genetics, quote, most monozygotic twin pairs are not identical. Several types of phenotypic discordance may be observed, such as the differences in susceptibilities to diseases and a wide range of anthropomorphic features." Unquote. The authors of this article found that there are modifications to our genes that occur over time, which are called epigenetic modifications. These modifications can cause the differences that are seen in so-called identical twins. Although some of these epigenetic modifications may be due to environmental factors like smoking, Many of these modifications are just random events that occur when cells divide. As the authors state here, quote, Smoking habits, physical activity, or diet, among others, are external factors that have been proposed to have long-term influence on epigenetic modifications. However, it is possible that small defects in transmitting epigenetic information through successive cell divisions or maintaining it in differentiated cells accumulate in a process that could be considered as an epigenetic drift associated with the aging process." Unquote. So, Environmental factors in hair loss are pretty overblown. Usually they're overblown by people who want to sell some bullshit product or program where they insist there is more to fighting hair loss than DHT. However, admittedly, there may be a few environmental factors that do exist which do hurt your hair. This would include things like smoking, which can injure the hair follicles and make hair loss worse. And Dr. Greger goes over some of these factors, and I did too in my video on smoking and hair loss, which I'll link below. He also brings up mercury contamination from fish which is an interesting point. It's not clear how much of a role mercury contamination plays in hair loss, but mercury is definitely not something you want in your diet. So any advice on how to reduce mercury consumption, including eliminating fish from your diet, is a good thing regardless of hair loss, so I don't take any issue with his advice here. He also mentions how biotin deficiencies can cause hair loss, but that biotin deficiencies are also very rare. And furthermore, biotin supplements can contain far too much biotin and can actually be detrimental detrimental to your health. He brings up how egg consumption can interfere with biotin consumption, which is true since egg whites contain avidin, which is an anti-nutrient that lowers biotin absorption in the gut, although you'd need to consume large quantities of it, probably up to 20 or more egg whites per day, which I know some people actually do thanks to overhyped health claims about eggs from keto cultists online, so it's still worth bringing up. Dr. Greger also mentions that other severe vitamin and mineral deficiencies like zinc can cause hair loss, but then he accurately points out that these deficiencies, just like biotin deficiencies, are extremely rare, and that taking supplements just isn't necessary so long as your diet contains adequate amounts of nutrients. And 
So far, I have to say this is pretty good advice, although I think he probably could have done a better job of pointing out the limitations of the twin studies, since oftentimes these studies, like I said, are exploited by snake oil salesmen and hairline fraud sales to sell their bullshit products and programs. Often these scam artists will argue that genetics is just one piece of the big picture behind hair loss, when the reality is, is that with rare exceptions, genetics is still by far the biggest factor in hair loss. We know this because in populations of people who have genetic deficiencies in the 5-AR enzyme and thus lower DHT levels that these people will never experience hair loss no matter what their lifestyle is like. Like we went over earlier, differences in hair loss amongst twins can be accounted for by some lifestyle practices that we know exacerbate hair loss, such as smoking and possibly alcohol use, or maybe from mercury poisoning from eating too much fish. But likely, these differences are mostly just from random epigenetic drift that occur as twins age and the cells divide. So if you smoke or drink too much or eat fish every day, sure, some of your hair loss may be worse because of that, but in general, don't expect lifestyle changes to do too much of anything at all to help your hair. After all, there are plenty of people in perfect health who are completely bald, as well as people who look like Nikocado Avocado who still have full heads of hair. As far as vitamin and mineral deficiencies go, they just aren't a cause of hair loss in the developed world. So don't think that popping a biotin supplement or using a shampoo with a biotin or sal palmetto supplement or whatever the hell is in it is going to do any good for your hair whatsoever. So, so far, Dr. Gregor and I are pretty much on the same wavelength here. So let's move on to a second video in his trilogy on hair loss. This next video is called Pills for Hair Growth. Of course, he's talking about finasteride minoxidil here. These are the two FDA-approved hair loss treatments, after all. He points out that it is a myth that other hair loss remedies sold on the internet can cure hair loss, and that these remedies actually turn out to be more expensive than the FDA-approved drugs. So I've got to agree with him here. That's all perfectly reasonable, of course. However, here's where I think Dr. Gregor starts to become a little bit more misleading. The drugs can help, but can cause side effects. The Propecia can diminish libido and cause sexual dysfunction, while the topical minoxidil can cause itching. Uh, though I believe this is a typo for scaling, much better than scalping. Here's a more comprehensive list of the more common side effects. To understand why there are so many hormonal side effects for Propecia, like impotence, testicular pain, breast enlargement, you have to understand how the drug works. So here he brings up the possible side effects from finasteride minoxidil, and then he goes on to say that to understand the side effects of finasteride, we have to know how the drug works. Unfortunately, he never puts these side effects into context. What I mean by this is that from his video, you'd have no clue how often side effects occur with finasteride. It could be everyone gets side effects as far as you can tell from the video. In actuality though, the risk of side effects from using finasteride to treat hair loss are very, very low, and I did a video going over this data that I'll link below. Now, I don't expect Dr. Greger to reiterate every little piece of clinical data ever published on finasteride. I mean, that's my job, of course. But he is presenting the subject of hair loss to an audience who are likely laymen on the subject, so he could have gone into a little bit more detail about just how low the prevalence of side effects really are. In large studies of subjects taking finasteride at 1 mg per day, which is the standard dose for hair loss, the high end of the percentage of sexual side effects was just 4.2% with finasteride and 2.2% with placebo in one study. In another study, the side effects were down as low as 1.9% with finasteride versus 0.9% with placebo. It's this data that allows us to say that the real incidence of sexual side effects due to taking 1 mg of finasteride daily is only 1-2%. to In these original studies, the incidence incidence of side effects actually decreased if the drug was continued, and none of these side effects were permanent when the drug was stopped. In fact, the incidence of side effects may even be less than what I just reported. In a meta-analysis, which is a combination of data from multiple studies, there was actually no increase in sexual side effects compared with, with placebo when looking at a total of over 17,000 subjects on finasteride at 1 milligram per day versus placebo. So by not even mentioning this low incidence of side effects, Dr. Greger is letting the viewer form his or her own conclusion about how frequent side effects are with finasteride. He's not actually giving 
spreading misinformation, but he's kind of implying that the side effects are frequent. So this little bit of fear mongering is his setup for the next video on vegan treatments for hair loss. Anyways, if you want more detailed information on the incidence of finasteride side effects, I have made several videos addressing that very subject, but I'll go ahead and link one of the more detailed videos below in case you haven't seen it yet. So Dr. Greger then talks about how finasteride works, and he unfortunately manages to confuse the issue even more. Androgens, uh, male hormones like testosterone, are the principal drivers of hair growth in both men and women. We know this from studies a half century ago that show that castration of men stopped hair loss. Well, both these statements are true, but it doesn't make sense the way he says it. He says androgens are the principal drivers of hair growth in men and women, but then he says we know this because castration stops hair loss. Well, by saying that, he makes it sound like androgens aren't the principal driver of hair loss, since if you get rid of androgens through castration, then you would expect your hair to fall out, but instead the opposite happens. Castration actually stops hair loss. So. This is the problem with trying to oversimplify something as complicated as hair loss. Yes, it's true that androgens, specifically the trash hormone DHT, drive the development of beard and body hair during puberty, but DHT in adulthood in people with the genetics for androgenic alopecia actually causes hair loss, which is why castration reverses this hair loss. If you suppress the trash hormone DHT, hopefully with finasteride and not with castration, you will get a cessation of hair loss and likely you will get hair regrowth as well. If if you've watched my video, then this is of course not news chums, but if you were unaware of how androgenic alopecia works and watched this video by Dr. Greger, I think you'd be totally confused, especially since Dr. Greger's audience are just noobs who are probably convinced veganism will solve every problem in the world somehow. Anyways. Dr. Greger goes off into a tangent into the history of castration and eugenics in the United States as well as Germany, which is pretty interesting but really has nothing to do with the subject, so we'll go ahead and skip this as it's pretty irrelevant. So he gets back to androgens again, and he brings up the 5-alpha reductase enzyme that converts testosterone into the trash hormone DHT. He goes on to baselessly say that the decrease in DHT is what causes erectile dysfunction, and then he claims that this can last for years, whereas for men it has the the sexual side effects like erectile dysfunction, which can affect men for years. He even says that in 20% of subjects, these side effects can be permanent. Side effects that may even be permanent. Up to 20% of subjects reporting persistent sexual dysfunction for six or more years after stopping the drug, suggesting the possibility that it may never go away. He is quoting a study by Dr. Earwig here, who is of course one of the handful of doctors alongside others like Dr. Trash, who make a career out of pushing the post-finasteride syndrome conspiracy theory, which is the fake condition where people claim that finasteride side effects are permanent. These doctors get funding from scam organizations like the PFS Network to fund fake bullshit studies that have no control groups and are tainted by massive selection bias problems. Specifically, these doctors who conduct these anti-finasteride studies recruit their subjects from the Propecia Health Forums, which is a finasteride-hating cult where people attribute every problem imaginable to finasteride, whether it be finasteride making their anus numb or finasteride making them gay or transgendered. Anyways, Dr. Greger quotes a very misleading quote from the abstract of Dr. Earwig's paper. The quote says, quote, In a clinical series, 20% of subjects with male pattern hair loss reported persistent sexual dysfunction for greater than six years, suggesting the possibility that the dysfunction may be permanent. Unquote. Wait a minute. 20% of men taking finasteride for hair loss develop persistent sexual dysfunction for greater than six years? That's what it sounds like, and that's what Dr. Greger implies here. What clinical series is Dr. Irwick talking about here, I wonder? Well, if you actually read Dr. Irwick's paper, he's talking about his own study report in this paper, not some earlier study, which is what the sentence sounds like. And in this study, all the subjects were from the Propecia Help Forum veterans, and all of them complained of persistent sexual dysfunction after taking finasteride. The 20% number refers to the number of these, of these PFS claimants whose sexual dysfunction lasted over six years. So like with all the fraudulent PFS studies, this study fails to prove any link between taking finasteride and persistent sexual dysfunction. As Dr. Earwig himself says in his paper, the only true way to prove or disprove post-finasteride syndrome would be to do a prospective randomized study, but Dr. Earwig admits, quote, 
Although a large, well-powered, randomized control trial lasting several years would be the ideal way to determine the incidence of persistent side effects of an asteroid, such a large trial is unlikely to be funded." Unquote. So, the PFS network, formerly known as the PFS Foundation, has been funding bullshit studies for years. You'd think after all this time they try to use the money they raise from their gullible donors to fund this type of definitive study, but instead they keep funding these bogus Dr. Earwig and Dr. Trash studies that have the exact same flaws, meaning no control group and selection bias problems. It's almost as if they know the condition is bullshit and are too afraid to fund a legitimate study since it will confirm that post-finasteride syndrome is a fake condition which will cause the money to dry up and the PFS network will have to give up their luxurious lifestyle of lavish mansions and exotic sports cars. So next Dr. Gregor brings up neurosteroids as if we don't already hear enough about this goddamn subject. What we think might be happening is that the drug may actually structurally change the part of your brain responsible for sexual function. Now, I just did three new videos on neurosteroids in addition to one earlier I made about a year ago, so I won't repeat the arguments I made about why finasteride does not significantly affect neurosteroid levels, and I'll link those videos below. But very briefly, let me say that the problem with saying that finasteride alters neurosteroid levels is the fact that finasteride blocks the type 2 5-AR isoenzyme. The reason why that's important is because the predominant isoenzyme in the brain is the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme, and there is in fact no type 2 5 5-AR isoenzyme activity in the brain. The reason that rodent studies show effects from finasteride on neurosteroid levels is due to species differences between rodents and humans. In rodents, unlike in humans, finasteride is a strong type 1 isoenzyme blocker as well as a type 2 blocker. Also, these rodent studies use doses of finasteride, which when adjusted for weight, are hundreds of times higher than a normal human dose. But despite these problems, these are the studies that people like Dr. Earwig, Dr. Trash, and the PFS network love to quote to get their precious donations nation money, and it looks like Dr. Greger has unfortunately decided to drink the neurosteroid Kool-Aid, which really makes me wonder if the PFS network might be slipping him a paycheck. Finally, Dr. Greger brings up neurosteroid levels in the cerebral spinal fluid. And indeed, though blood levels of hormones in users with persistent effects appear normal, if you do a spinal tap and look at the cerebral spinal fluid surrounding their brains, neurosteroid levels do appear to end up being altered. He quotes from another Dr. Earwig review article in which Dr. Earwig mentions a study where the neurosteroid hormone called allopregnanolone was lower in the cerebral spinal fluid of subjects claiming to have post-finasteride syndrome versus control subjects. Well, I covered this all in a previous video too that I'll link below, but the basic problem with this spinal fluid study thing is that the comparison group in the study is a group of age-matched subjects without any symptoms of post-finasteride syndrome, meaning they didn't have erectile dysfunction or depression which are the biggest features of post-finasteride syndrome. Even Dr. Earwig, in a broken clock moment, points out that the decrease in allopregnanolone in the spinal fluid is not a feature of taking finasteride. It is something that happens with depression from any cause. He says, quote, as compared to non-depressed adults, depressed adults have lower cerebral spinal levels of allopregnanolone, unquote. So, it's not surprising that people with post-finasteride syndrome, where a big feature of that fake condition is depression, that these alleged post-finasteride syndrome sufferers would have lower spinal fluid allopregnanolone levels than non-depressed control subjects. This has nothing to do with whether the depression and other symptoms of these post-finasteride syndrome subjects was caused by finasteride. Again, I have gone over the spinal fluid nonsense in more detail in my earlier videos, but all this data is flawed due to the lack of a truly comparable control group, and it's disappointing that Dr. Greger isn't more skeptical than he is. So what about foods, uh, things we could eat to combat hair loss? That's exactly what we're going to explore next. So after fear-mongering about finasteride, he asks whether there is any food that can be used to treat hair loss, and that's the subject of the next video. So let's move on to the last of the troika of videos titled Food for Hair Growth. So what role might diet play in the treatment of hair loss? Human experiments with fecal transplants offer a clue to how powerful our microbiome is. Well, that's all pretty jarring to hear, because here I am ready to hear about vegan cuisine, and he's talking about fecal transplants. Totally bald guy starts growing back hair a few months after a fecal transplant, and a little over a year later, 
check it out, completely regrown. So pretty amazing, right? Even after starting off the video where he defines androgenic alopecia and says how it's one of the most common conditions seen by dermatologists, he pulls a bait and switch because the guy in the picture sure as hell doesn't look like he has androgenic alopecia, and that's because he doesn't. The type of hair loss this guy has is called alopecia universalis, which is a form of alopecia areata, which has nothing at all to do with androgenic alopecia. It is an autoimmune disorder, and this study theorized that possibly putting a fecal transplant in someone with alopecia areata may affect their immune system and regrow their hair. However, Dr. Greger doesn't even mention this little detail. It's just a way for him to make a point about diet affecting hair, I guess, as well as to make a poorly timed joke about brown smoothies. Smoothies. The moral of the story is not to drink brown smoothies, but to keep your good gut bugs happy. He next brings up a study on the Mediterranean diet and androgenic alopecia. In this study from Italy, 104 subjects seen in a dermatology clinic for androgenic alopecia were compared to 108 men without androgenic alopecia. The investigators asked all the men about their diet. Here are the results of their answers. Yes, they looked at about 15 dietary habits and found that the men without androgenic alopecia ate more raw vegetables per week, meaning at least three times per week. They also used more fresh herbs, meaning regular use of at least three different herbs. Now, I think this study is flat out ridiculous. I try to have an open mind about whether diet might improve or worsen the degree of androgenic alopecia, but remember, the two groups here either had or didn't have androgenic alopecia. So I'm somehow expected to believe that the difference between having or not having androgenic alopecia is eating two versus three servings of raw vegetables per week, or if that I add rosemary to my food, I'll suddenly have a full head of hair. I'm expected to believe that? Will you who shut is up, your, man? Listen, who Clearly, there are other reasons for these results. First of all, the men with androgenic alopecia were younger than the control group, so maybe they just had shittier diets like many younger people who like to live off of ramen, ice cream, Twinkies, Mountain Dew, and Easy Mac. Also, we don't know the marital status of these men. Maybe fewer of the bald men were married because they were bald and therefore they had to cook for themselves, while the men with good heads of hair had great Italian wives who cooked them delicious meals with lots of health-promoting herbs and spices. Also, this study suffers from having too many comparisons, meaning there are so many different ways to look at diet that you are bound to find some differences just by chance alone. For example, why did they choose the cutoff at the number of vegetables and the number of spices at three? Probably because if they chose two or four, the results wouldn't have been statistically significant. With a study like this, you can look at all possible parameters and vary them until you get something that is statistically significant, but it's just because of chance. This is called the multiple comparisons problem, which is a common flaw in poorly designed studies. Here is an example where the number of letters in the winning word in the script spelling bee correlates with the number of people killed by venomous spiders each year. The moral here is that if you look at enough parameters, you're bound to find something that appears to correlate, but it's just by chance. As well as the frequent consumption of soy milk. So then, just for good measure, he throws in soy milk as being beneficial to hair loss based on this study. Now, this is a study from Taiwan, and it is yet another fishing expedition, just like the previous study, that's looking for correlations between androgenic alopecia severity and a whole slew of factors, including age, residence area, work hours, sleep patterns, cigarette usage, alcohol consumption, uh, betel nut usage, hair treatments, eating habits, body heavy metal concentrations, and certain genes within 354 men. So, these researchers are looking at even more parameters than in the last study. When they divided the groups into Norwood type 1 to 3 versus Norwood type 4 to 7, the investigators found that serum vanadium levels and drinking at least 1 to 3 soy beverages per week was associated with lower Norwood scores. So, I had the same objections to the study as in the last study, but here they looked at even more parameters, so the odds that these findings are just by chance are even higher than they were last time. Nevertheless, it still fits into Dr. Greger's vegan confirmation bias narrative that plants contain phytochemicals that protect against hair loss. Now, as a proud vegan soy boy myself who regularly drinks soy milks and enjoys it, I don't have any delusion that it's going to help my hair. I drank it long before I started finasteride, and I started balding all the same. And for from the looks of things, it looks like it really hasn't helped Dr. Greger all that much either. And yes, I know that's a cheap shot, but sorry, I couldn't resist. Dr. Greger then states that he is skeptical of claims that complementary and alternative medicine can cure hair loss. 
For example, many studies have little relevance because the evidence was obtained on shaved rodents. Yeah, I agree. Many of the claims are based on rodent studies that don't apply to humans. And even when they do clinical studies on actual people, sometimes there's no placebo control, so you have no idea if the food had anything to do with it. Yes, I agree here too. The lack of a control group is common in human studies for treatments of androgenic alopecia, especially when it comes to bro science treatments like scalp massages and broccoli. But there has been a randomized, double blind, placebo controlled study of compounds in hot peppers and soy. So he next brings up this next study of capsaicin and isoflavones that are found in hot peppers and soy. This is primarily a mouse study, and it shows that these compounds increase IGF-1 levels in mice, which is a growth factor that could stimulate hair growth. The human part of the study included 48 volunteers with alopecia, though only 34 of them had androgenic alopecia, while the rest had alopecia totalis or alopecia areata, a fact that Dr. Greger doesn't bother mentioning. Anyways, after five months of either capsaicin plus isoflavones versus placebo control, there was an increase in IGF-1 levels in both the control and the treatment group, as you can see here. Although if you look at the graph, supposedly the differences in IGF-1 levels was only statistically significant in the treatment group on the right, though the two effects don't look all that different to me. In fact, overall, the placebo group started out with and then ended up with higher IGF-1 levels than in the treatment group, yet supposedly the treatment group had more hair growth as shown in these sample photos here. This doesn't make much sense if the absolute level of IGF-1 was the most important factor. Anyways, the results were based on just analyses of before and after photos, and no phototrichograms were used in the study, which is a big deal since phototrichograms are the most objective measurement for assessing hair growth or hair loss. So even though the mouse results are interesting, I don't think this study is great evidence that popping hot peppers and drinking soy milk are going to regrow your hair anytime soon. So after a little digression on how many peppers and how much soy you need to eat to replicate the doses in this study, Dr. Grigger comes to the last study of this video. There's also been a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of pumpkin seed oil. You heard it there, Chums. The vegan answer to hair loss is pumpkin seed oil. Well, actually, no, it isn't. Truth is, is that pumpkin seed oil is completely worthless, and I actually did a video on this very study where I debunked it over a year ago, and I'll link it below if you haven't seen it yet. Here's the study in question, which is from Good Korea, which normally is a good source for hair loss information, even though this study is, of course, completely bullshit. Anyways, let's just listen to what Dr. Greger's analysis of the study is and hear what he has to say. 76 men with male pattern baldness received 400 mg of pumpkin seed oil a day, hidden in capsules, or they took capsules filled instead with a placebo, for a few months. After 24 weeks of treatment, self-rated improvement and satisfaction scores in the actual pumpkin seed oil group was higher, and they objectively had more hair, a 40% increase in hair counts compared to only 10% in the placebo group. Here are some representative before and after shots of the improvement in hair coverage on two and a half pumpkin seeds worth of daily oil. Show those pictures to blinded investigators who don't know who's in which group, and they rate the placebo groups as getting slightly worse over time, but the pumpkin seed oil group getting significantly better. OK, cool story, bro. So what about side effects? They looked before and after an index of erectile dysfunction and found no evidence of adverse effects. Wow, no side effects. That sounds too good to be true, right? Well, there are a couple of problems with this study. For one, despite its title talking about pumpkin seed oil, this is actually not a study about pumpkin seed oil at all. Rather, what the subjects in the study received was 400 milligrams of something called Octasabal Plus. This is something made by a good Korean company called Dream Plus Company Limited. Okay, so what's actually in this Okta Sable Plus thing? Well, an internet search brings us to the Dream Plus Company website, which shows pretty cool looking black capsules, which I guess is pretty cool because you know, people say I'm all about the black pill, yo. But anyways, color aside, let's look at the ingredients in the supplement. Okay. First ingredient we have is something called octocosinol. Then the second ingredient we have is pumpkin powder. So this isn't even pumpkin seed oil, it's pumpkin powder, which I imagine is not exactly the same thing as pumpkin seed oil. That would be like saying avocado oil is the same thing as guacamole, but that's not all. The rest of the ingredients are mixed vegetable powder, evening primrose powder, corn silk extracted powder, red clover powder, and tomato powder. So this sounds like the typical bullshit herbal 
herbal remedy you'd find from some quack doctor like Dr. Mercola's website. So even if we're to assume it works, which I doubt, how do we know that eating two pumpkin seeds a day, as Dr. Greger recommends, would be the equivalent of this Octa Sable Plus stuff, which remember, doesn't even have pumpkin seed oil in it. Maybe it would be better to just buy a bottle of the stuff. So let's go ahead and see. Let's look at how much it cost. Wow. Fuck that. No wonder it has a zero star rating. I've seen PS5 scalpers on eBay less greedy than this company. A year supply of this crap could probably buy you a hair transplant. So this makes me suspicious of this study. You guys want to take a wild guess as to who sponsored it? Well, in a bit of news which will surprise absolutely nobody, the study was sponsored by Dream Plus, the makers of, you guessed it, Octa Sable Plus. So I'm sorry, this is not a clean study, and you certainly can't put all your hopes on eating two pumpkin seeds per day to save your hair based on the study. So sorry, Dr. Gregor, I'm simply not buying it, and not just because it costs $570. So after saying pumpkin seed oil had no adverse effects, the video just abruptly ends. No summary and no dramatic climax, kind of like the ending to Game of Thrones. Now, my rule of thumb for any treatment is that if a therapy has no potential for adverse effects, then it will have no beneficial effects either. And I've talked about this in many of my previous videos. You know, there are a lot of natural plant or fungus-based products that have a small amount of 5-AR blocking effects, such as reishi mushrooms, stinging nettle root, and salt palmetto. In terms of mechanism, they may be superficially similar to finasteride, but none of them have the powerful 5-AR blocking effect of finasteride or dutasteride, and you need that kind of effect to halt or reverse androgenic alopecia, as DHT suppression needs to hit a certain threshold before it is effective at all, and I talk about this in my optimal dosing of finasteride video, which I'll link below. Food isn't going to stop your hair loss. Sorry to Danny, Roddy, and all the Ray Pete fanboys out there, but the carrot salad, aspirin, and orange juice aren't going to do jack shit. Despite what every hipster dumbass likes to claim, food is not medicine. None of the studies Dr. Kreger quotes compares the results of plant-based treatments to drug treatments, and that's because none of them would be even in the same solar system in terms of efficacy. So, there's plenty of good reasons to go vegan. Hell, depending on your current diet, there may even be some good health reasons to go vegan, especially when it comes to cardiovascular health, but the strongest arguments in favor of veganism are rooted in ethics. I am vegan because mentally, I could not handle the idea of contributing to the diabetes Diabolical cruelty I know animals endure on a daily basis so people can enjoy meat. I would love it if as many people could go vegan as possible, but the last thing I would want is to convince people to go vegan for fallacious reasons. And that is why the worst thing vegans can do is oversell the benefits of a vegan lifestyle. If you tell someone the truth about veganism, that veganism isn't easy, that it requires you to make compromises to your convenience and comfort levels, then I know that if that person does go vegan, they'll do so for sincere reasons, knowing what it entails. But if you start telling people nonsense, like if you go vegan, you'll have all these miraculous benefits like regrowing your hair, then people are going to eventually realize that they were scammed, and it will only hurt the vegan movement. I know it sucks as a vegan knowing that animals are suffering on a daily basis, but if we promote veganism on a pack of lies, then the short-term benefits of people going vegan will not make up for the inevitable long-term damage to the movement's image as a whole, which is important because I, of course, do believe that veganism is an important ethical movement that will benefit the world. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and go pop up an asteroid and down it with a cold glass of soy milk. So I'll see you next time, my fellow hair loss witchers. Take care and God bless.